So I'm going live yeah. to YouTube. Okay, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, or I'll bring that time. Okay. I got that information to do it that way. Okay. Did Council Law needs to just run away. What's that? Oh. Council Law. I'd like to call this meeting, special meeting of August 11th to order with the adoption of the agenda. Okay, require a mover and a seconder. Moved by Councillor Kelly, seconded by Councillor Boyd. That the draft agenda presented to Council for the special meeting and dated the 11th day of August 2020 be hereby adopted as circulated. All the papers. Well, thank you very much. Um, any pecuniary interest or uh, general nature thereof? Is it fair? There being none, we will proceed with our agenda. Uh, on that note, I would like to provide just a few opening remarks. Um, as uh, an introduction to our presentation and our, our guest speaker. Uh, first and foremost, I'd also like to welcome the members of the steering committee that are here. Um, so the steering committee has consisted of our architect, Brian Bertram, uh, our CAO, Christine Gertier, uh, our building inspection inspector and bylaw enforcement officer, Claire Gerbet, our director of public works and engineer, Antoine Boucher, and great uh, tech master, who is our consultant for the municipality. And so, welcome for being here today. Um, I'd also like to thank Council for being available this afternoon. I know there's always lots going on, um, but I wanted to make a few comments um, as part of the, the opening. In the last few months, I myself, I've questioned myself on the municipal office hire hall program, not on its uh, reason for being, on its importance, but maybe more so on its timing and on its location. And I wanted to share with you the, what helped me resolve, what helped me get over some of those hesitations or questions that I had. And, um, and so first and foremost, uh, as we know, I do engage in conversations with our MP and our MVP. So certainly, and we'll be speaking about that in our uh, special council, uh, in our special meeting afterwards. Uh, so that made a difference. Uh, but at the same time, we were doing the research for the book on uh, Cobia, uh, our home, a part of our pandemic project that Steve and I are on. And basically, the work, work's all done. And, but, but as part of that research for, uh, for that book, there's a few findings that came forward that really helped me uh, with this specific project. And so um, I was really struck when I read that it was in 1943 in the midst, right after the Great Depression, and in the midst of world, world, I always have hard time that, world war. war II, that Michel's grandfather, Joseph Boyer, who was the mayor at the time, called for a municipal office. Of all times, you know, I, I don't necessarily know if it's a straight comparison of we're living now with the pandemic, uh, with that era, but my impressions are that in our municipality, those were very, very uh, difficult times. And so, Basically, the council supporters were unanimous. So they decided to move from Durland Road, and that's on Durland that our first municipal office was built in 1900 and was built. And so basically, 43 years later, they decided they needed a new municipal office. And they wanted to come in the village of Scorpio. It was very important to them to come and situate the office here. So basically, uh, we went, it was on the other side of the street where the garage is, is where they built the new municipal office. It was basically a garage from what I understand. Uh, and it wasn't completed until 1950. It's really interesting when you read through the minutes on how frugal they were. And in 1950, they bought 25 chairs and a sheet of plywood for the council table and the office that had an official opening. That was the new, the new municipal office. Um, and so, so that for me spoke to whether it's difficult times, there are times that uh, you have to go forward with certain projects, I think, but that's for me helping move, over, move on with that, that issue of the pandemic. I also
also question myself on the location, recognizing that we're building here in a floodplain. And it does, without a doubt, bring its share of problems as our architect will allude to today. Um, but here again, there are elements that helped me move on, and I'll share them with you. Certainly, the enthusiasm of the North Green Outdoor Conservation Authority, and we can, we can speak to that as we move on, but uh, very enthusiastic about this, this project. They're saying that we're going to be enhancing our footprint. And so I was delighted by that. But also here again, history had some lessons to share uh, on that particular point. It's in the, um, in the early 1960s that uh, the Council of the Day that was led by Leo Savatch, and Leo, as you know, is uh, the father of the Law uh, Park. Yes. And um, uh, and Taiwan, uh, basically. Jenny. Jenny and And so they decided at that time that they could no longer live in the garage because everyone who would come to the garage could see all the documents. So it wasn't confidential enough. So they needed a new municipal office. And so uh, basically, this is in 1960. Okay, 23 years later, only 23 years later, they said we need a new municipal office again. Okay, and so. This is where the villagers said, no way is this municipal office going out of this village. There was no way they were going to let it leave the village of Corbia, the heart of Corbia. So there had been land that had been, this land had been donated by Madame uh, Anne-Marie Bigal, who she used to live just across the road there on a hill she had told me, she was named Charette, Madame Charette, by her. And um, she had given the land to, um, uh, to Ressavage. Uh, you probably remember Ray Savage, and because he was a, the, the recreation committee and it was not part of the municipality, it was a village recreation committee. So she had given the land for the town, for the for the uh, for, uh, for the recreation committee to use it for recreation purposes for for kids, for youth. And so when the talk came to build a municipal office, Ray Savage gave the land to the township so that in that spirit it could be used for a new municipal office. And the rest of the land maintained for recreation purposes. So as we go forward with our project, that has two components: the entire all and municipal office, as well as we know we've made an application to the uh, to the infrastructure fund for uh, recreational funds. It's again maintaining that spirit. So it's it's uh, respecting. I always give some support for the uh, the elders, as they say uh, in uh, the world of uh, uh, the Algonquins are. Ancestors on this land, it's always important to respect your ancestors. So that was the spirit in the village. They wanted us very much to remain in the village, and those were that was the purpose uh, that we had been uh, encouraged for this land. So we're respecting that as we move forward. So I'm very delighted by that as well. Um, and so in 1967, what, uh, basically from 1943 1967 is when they opened the, uh, the new office here. Uh, on this particular land. But today, Brian's going to talk, another item I have problems with uh, on this project, and I'll end with that, my last problem, was basically off lease the space. And I didn't share that completely with all of the steering committee members, but it always bothered me when they talked about so many square feet. So I thought, why aren't we just building for what we need today? I must admit, I thought, you know, it's a challenging environment, funds are challenging, why are we not just building what we need no more? And our architect has come to speaking of a 50 year horizon, the need for good planning purposes to be thinking, you know, 50 years out. And so, in, in reflecting on that, as I look back on our history from 1900 to 1943, that's 43 years. We built again in 67 from 1943. You can do the math, it's you know, less than 30 years. And then again, when we built in 1967, you would think that that would have been good enough to today. But no, in the 1990s, we had fixed that. We had to build a fire hall and we expanded. So again, here we are, uh, less than you know, 30 years, we need again to give you the office. So I bow my head to you, Mr. Architect, and I express my uh, regret for ever, ever having doubted as, as I reflected uh, coming to this meeting on that history. I can see that there's a lot of validity in thinking uh, in terms of uh, future needs as well. So, and so basically, while today we're being asked uh, for approval, there's going to be an approval at the end of this meeting. When it has a re or, or, pardon me, has a resolution prepared asking us to approve uh, to be able to proceed to tender. That is the step uh, that's before us. But in my view, it, it, this is just a step because we don't yet have all of the information. It's when we're going to go out to tender, we're going to have the prices that come back in, 
that we will have all of the information we need to make a, uh, an informed decision. And so truly for me, it's in about five weeks time, I guess, and, uh, that we will be providing the true approval. And then only then will we have the, I guess, the full picture that will allow us to decide how we want to proceed. But I guess the final comment I want to make, and I, I would really like to make it because I find it is important. I really like what we've been brought both ways. Um, and I really compliment this, the, uh, our professionals and our steering committee for the work that is coming uh, forward. Um, the construction project, because as we were evolving through this uh, pandemic and with time, it, it's been prepared in options. So basically what our architect is going to be sharing with us today are options. Option A, B, C, D. He will focus mainly on the four options. But surely there are more combinations, I would say. I think uh, our CEO said yesterday there's probably option A to H, but before us, so it will be very important that we take the time to truly understand the options. Because when the time comes to make that decision in five weeks, we may decide that there's different options, different ways that we will, that, that are before us that may work best given the market uh, environment. At that time, in five weeks time, we can decide to not proceed. That, that will always be before us, and that is the day that we will make that call. Either we go for it or we don't. We can also, at that day, decide to put the project on hold uh, and put forward it for, uh, for, the, for the day. Uh, we may choose. Our, our steering committee is going to be analyzing all of the tenders. Uh, we have, a, I think, we pre-selected about 10 different contractors that are going to be bidding on our project. And so um, our steering committee is going to be doing the analysis of the tender and bringing forward a recommendation to us. Hello, Kathy She's just uh, walking in and coming to join us. Um, and so on that day, we may decide to endorse the steering committee recommendation. Or we may decide to say, what well, if we'd like to tweak it? Maybe uh, instead of option A, we'll pick option C, option, and make some changes. In it. So again, speaking to the need today to really spend time and understand the various, uh, the various combinations and permutations of options that are before us. So I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to make these opening remarks, and I wish us a good meeting. And on that note, I'm very delighted that, that to welcome our architect, Mr. Brian Dachin, uh, to lead us through this presentation. Merci. Um, thank you very much, Mayor, Councillors. Uh, yes, sorry, I'm back to you guys. Um, so first of all, it's great to hear. It's great to see some people. I'm tired of being in a basement, working like a mushroom. So it's great to get out once in a while and actually see some people. Um, so I, I, I put together a presentation today um, and sort of that's generally the agenda. It's very high level, uh, but I just wanted to sort of introduce um, the project and the parameters we work with, try and have, uh, understand a bit of a reconciliation. I find it's always helpful when it's just not starting cold. So where was the last time I presented to you, it was some high level overarching issues uh, and then sort of take you step by step to the major milestones of what uh, has transpired and what has happened. Uh, first being, we took our preliminary drawings and sent it up to the quantity surveyor, a third party costing a consulting firm out of Toronto. Jason, you can go back. Thanks. Sorry. Um, and uh, I'll throw my pen at you. <laughs> so, so cost, uh, cost investigations were undertaken and um, uh, to Nobody surprised. The scope came in uh, over uh, our budget. Uh, so then we presented to uh, yeah, a steering committee various options. Uh, I'm committed to meet uh, your, param your parameters that were quite clear as well as your budget. Um, so we presented some options, and then as we worked through it, more information came to play. Uh, the soils report came in. We found out more about the septic system and the type things that were required. We had meetings with the North Bay Manawa Conservation Authority. Uh, we've undertaken several other studies such as energy efficiencies. Um, we, along with North Bay Manawa Conservation Authority, have developed a phasing approach to construction on site. We have um, brought along sort of progress prints, but also a high level analysis of where we stand with the current documents, just to give you a feel. 
Uh, and then from that, because of the options, various other sub-options presented themselves that we've explored. Again, once again, to give you some um, different opportunities, a different look, uh, which we'll uh, present in terms of boardrooms and uh, finally the impacts and directions of what all of this means and a little bit of a discussion about timing and schedule going forward, especially under the veil of COVID. So, and as well, uh, I please ask if please jump in if there's any questions rather than wait until the end. It's great if it's a dialogue, uh, you know, ask any questions whatsoever. Uh, my commitment to you is if I don't know, I'll be telling you straight out, straight forward, uh, but I will go back and make a commitment to find out and get you the information. But chances are we should have a good feel for pretty well everything we're presenting. So when we started, uh, there are bit from the minutes, so there's very clear parameters that were set and provided to us. Number one, in terms of priorities, was a new municipal office. That was your number one priority. Secondly, was the potential for a new fire hall. Uh, and third, was the potential for some upgrading to the seniors building. So those were the parameters uh, and the budget that we were provided originally with four million, and then the discussion of two million for site work. So globally, six million dollars plus taxes. In you receive some uh, uh, you know, refund from federal government or provincial government, but it's basically six million plus the one point six seven uh, percent of the thirteen percent on uh, rebate tax. So that was kind of the framework that we started. So uh, when we last met, I provided what was called a functional program. It was a high level analysis of all the requirements and data sheets of the staff. We also provided some master planning and some preliminary sketches. So that was the framework that we, we provided. And away we went uh, to uh, provide all the preliminary documentation in the month of April to the quantity surveyor uh, group called A.W. Hooker. We had put it out to tender. Uh, they were most competitive. Uh, and you can see right directly out of their um, uh, cost report, the scope of work. And you can see in the yellow that defines basically the property in the area within which we were working. And if you look to the next slide, and what was I'd like to highlight at the time included in there was one septic system. So you can see roughly where it was placed. You can see a, a brief outline of a building and that's based on the master planning and was based by the lawyer of various work. So also included in their report uh, was uh, we're taking our plans and highlighting the areas that they were working with. And you can see schematically uh, that there was two floor levels, the main floor level and an upper floor level consisting mostly of mezzanine space and mechanical rooms that were all set for efficiencies on, on an upper level. Um, so if you move to the next slide, uh, and so they then provide, an, uh, it's a class B estimate. I don't know if everyone's familiar with how their estimates are, are put forward. You start with a class B and move towards a class A. Uh, in this uh, class B estimate, they were looking basically at unit rates. It's a, it's a consolidation of their experience, our documents and feedback. So there were several iterations they would take a look at what was provided, the high-level design briefs, and they would mix also some allowances and assumptions for things that may not be in, in the material from their experience. So if you go to the next slide, that yielded at the time on uh, April the 3rd, uh, a, a, a gross cost of 9230000 uh, which is a total estimate, and that was $444.52 a square foot. But interestingly enough, if you just keep go back to that slide, uh, you can't see it. But interestingly enough, they they've also assigned uh, various allowances. So they carry um, uh, some uh, infrastructure of uh, about three million dollars, demolition of uh, twenty thousand dollars site works. But they also carry saw costs uh, and allowances for escalation, for contingencies, uh, for a design contingency, which if you were to take it off of the 9 million, we were, we were about $7 million roughly in terms of cost. So, um, so they calculated their hot cost to be around that amount, but they also added contingency in, in for the future. So with our parameters and with our budget, comparing it to uh, what was you know, the quantity surveyors uh, initial 
costs. And you have to remember that a quantity, quantity surveyors firm are going to be somewhat conservative. They're certainly not going to cut it to the edge, and they're not going to try and do it. Uh, we actually did challenge them. We had our first estimate, and we kind of challenged them on a bit. And it was around the 10 million mark when we first started, after we had a bit of a discussion and dropped to nine. So obviously, it was trending towards you know, what the future might hold. So go to the next one, please. And it was based on what we call our base building for tender option A. So if you take a look at the floor plan, it includes uh, the fire hall, it includes the council chamber, um, it includes boardroom, it includes the new municipal office, and down the center are a number of shared areas. Uh, so we then put forward three, four options in terms of how to bring the project uh, in line, to keep it on budget, and give you the option of selection of what might be uh, reasonable uh, options at the time when the costs come in. So if you move to the next slide. So the first being, if we were to eliminate one bay of the fire hall, and I'll speak to the individual areas as we go through in a minute about the design, what's included. But so at a high level, first option, most logical, what if we got rid of one bay? Second option, we go, what if we got rid of all three bays and, and moved or kept the fire hall as it was, because it could potentially continue to exist on the same site. I'd see logical, keeping the parameters of your priorities, number one, municipal office, number two, fire hall. So that seemed to be an option, whether it's viable or not, that's your decision. Uh, option C and then option D, um, we looked at deleting the space allocated for council chambers or the flex space, but also associated with that are, are is a whole strip of space um, dedicated to washroom. Because of the large hall and because of the number of the volume of people, they're associated washrooms. If they leave, we have sufficient washroom within the building to handle already dedicated for staff and also to deal with the public on a small scale. So, so yeah. Brian, just for council's information, that size of space, that community hall and the council chamber space, was to see how many people and how many people stand. Just so they're aware, because we are going to get to another option. Yeah. Right. So uh, originally, um, and we've cut it down since then, but originally we were on the 300 person mark of standing packed in, and that comes from an Ontario building code calculation. If you take an area and under section 3.3.1, um, it, it, there's a chart and it's based for a space with non fixed seats, you require an area of 0.75 square meters per person. If you take the area and multiply it, you could potentially cram that many people into it. Um, doesn't mean you're going to, but we have to design worst case scenario. Seated, we're looking at, for the very first volley, we were looking at about 80 people seated, 50 public council members, some additional staff, and potentially people presenting. So that was sort of the first, the first, the very, very first volley when we went through. Um, then as we refined the, the project, it started to decrease. So we're currently at about 200 people standing and about 60 people in the range of 68 people seated. So, so then we went and uh, also uh, along with the option D is the in, will be an impact to your current boardroom. Uh, and we investigated that a little bit further along. So if we then move to the next slide, on April the 6th, so we received quantity surveyors report on the 3rd, on the 6th, we came back to the steering committee uh, and said, uh, well, um, if we reduce the mezzanine on the second floor, consolidate it on the first floor, let's get uh, uh, as efficient as we can. We reduced uh, an area of roughly 1,700, um, I can't read it, it's 2,170, okay, 2,000, Plus roughly 2,100 square 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 footage. If we were to take off the bay of the garage, it's roughly 1,500 square feet. If we reduce all three bays, we're 3,961, about 4,000 square feet. And if we uh, uh, reduce the council chambers, we were close to 3,500 square feet of, of area. And in addition to that, uh, we thought there'd be some potential uh, because of all the discussions we had had and, and um, from what we had listened to municipality buying certain pieces of equipment to do their own work, that we thought that there was some potential if the municipality undertook some of the basic, basic civil work, there could be a cost savings. So 
So the way we went was cost option A, and if we use, and what we did is we used the cost per square foot directly from the quantity surveyor's report. So $444.50 a square foot. So if we were to save a thousand square feet, that would be the direct uh, you know, cost savings based on a third part. So it's not a number we've created, and that was the basis for it. So we went through with options uh, one and two in terms of reducing the mezzanine, uh, and which yielded um, at the end of the day, seven, seven million, seven point five million with our first option, and that's uh, basically reducing the mezzanines uh, and reducing one carbon. So then we went further to take a look at option two, where uh, again we reduced the mezzanine. That's pretty well constant. We reduced three bays and some site works. We were down to six million and fifty thousand. So we thought, okay, well, we're getting within the range that seems somewhat reasonable. We went further and looked at uh, options one plus four plus five, but reduced the mezzanine, reduced the council chambers, strictly the council chambers at that time, and uh, also the site work was about 6.2 million. So I brought that forward. We had several discussions and um, went back to the drawing board and came up with an option B, where, uh, because the comment was, well, if you remove the council chambers, we really need a place to, to meet. You have to, in some fashion, uh, so what opportunities existed, and then as we looked at it closer, if we removed the council chambers, we did not require the washrooms. And that was a significant uh, opportunity to then reallocate some funds to providing a vehicle with which to improve the experience of council chambers and public meetings. And we carried that as an allowance. So uh, our base cost of 9.2, we reduced the mechanical electrical of 958,000. Uh, we reduced the stair to the second floor at 71,000. We reduced the council chambers 1.1. Uh, reduced the washrooms another million. And then we said we're going to then reallocate 250,000 as an allowance to however you as the client want to spend it to provide that opportunity. Uh, and uh, also some municipal work, a conservative effort of 300,000, brought us in 5.9 million. And buying another community fire base? Uh, and with this particular, there are three fire bays. There are three, so this preserves your fire base. Number one, a municipal office, and uh, three, a fire hall with three bays, and some means with which to enhance that experience for the public of a municipal gathering space. So it already highlights one combination it could be removing three bays or go to the two. So you as council, I'm just a vehicle with which to try and meet your parameters and acting as your consultant and third party. That's purely a political decision. Um, when the tenders come in and when the prices come in, uh, there are generally three options. One, it's going to be over budget. You look for those variations. Two, it's on budget. You decide if you still want to cut down and keep what you have. Number three, we're under budget. So it's purely, but we've tried to provide you with enough reasonable options, whether or not, so you, provide, you go to option D, uh, and if you're still not satisfied, and for whatever reason you want to, you know, utilize one of the other options, take away one, uh, one bay of the fire hall. That's still your problem. So it's it's purely um, your call uh, in terms of who uh, the client. So um, so with option D, this is sort of a floor plan of what option D would look like. It goes to your question of the three. Uh, Three days, um, and I'm not sure if I've gone through this. Jason, so go to the next slide, and, and then maybe to the back. But yeah, so it just gives you a feel. So if you want to go back, uh, so you can see here that the top left hand corner um, excludes the space for what was considered flex space and community hall. Down the left hand side was space for the water. But what we've maintained at all times, what we've tried to do is give you the potential to be flexible and to expand in the future. So we've not ever positioned the building that is, does not allow for future expansion. And then with the takeaways, it, we've provided, we believe we've provided some interesting spaces, public spaces that can be used as an amenity. So for example, the top left-hand corner, you'll see sort of dots or columns on the page. We're designing this space to be an enclosed courtyard. So we've taken away the council chambers, flex space, but we provided a hard surface space that could be used for public functions, whether or not 
whatever that be, farmer's market or some kind of activity or public gathering. So, and it's directly off the, uh, this computer building as well. And our vision at the time was taking that 250,000, improving, we created a list of what that actually meant, creating some connectivity between this space and that open space or improving this building so that if ever in the future, there was the opportunity to meet the funds and the will that you could expand in both directions as well as well as to the west either more washrooms or maintaining some other purpose so there's lots of flexibility with uh, this particular plan and option b right now with that option b how much space did you basically both building so we're looking we're looking at um so from the building to the face of, of the face building was six meters so roughly 20 feet at the start if we take away the washrooms we're another I can't see Jason. What's the dimension at the very top, left hand corner? Yeah, what's that one? I could not tell you. Okay. It's roughly 3. Point, uh, so we'll look at five meters. So we're another another 18 feet, roughly. So we're 20 plus 8, so about 38, close to 40 feet between here and the building with this particular option. Okay, so uh, it allows again for we envision this space is almost we call it a street. From a design perspective, whether it's 20 feet or 38 feet, if you think about a European street or a courtyard, there's an opportunity again to hold bizarre functions to use it in that fashion as a hard circle. Um, the next few slides, I was asked to insert, to give you a feel of what the building would look like with that space removed. And so these are elevations from the top one is elevation from the street side. They don't give a true feel for what it looks like. You know, I've got some perspectives prepared, prepared. But from the west side, the picture on the bottom, you can see the elevation on the left is that contained courtyard. On the right, with the slope is the facade of the building from the court, uh, from the new uh, municipal office. The next slide, and then from the north side, the very top, is an elevation of your new building with the three uh, fire bays on the left. Down the very middle uh, section is the entrance, new entrance, the open courtyard. And we employed some architectural techniques with which to tie this building into the other building. So we ran some horizontal structural members on some columns over and provided a, a new screen on two sides. So and I'll show you a picture of it in a moment. But from the street side, as you come in, you don't necessarily see at first glance this existing building. It looks like an entirely new building. So in other words, upgrading the facades, but we've not touched this building for multiple structural, mechanical, electrical, other reasons to try and uh, keep the cause and set the line. But it still uh, gives it some character. So if you go to the next slide, uh, and I've also included a roof plan. And I don't know if anyone wants to comment on the austerity of the roof plan but it's very intentional. What we have done is created two roof slopes and they slope from the front of the building to the back and there are absolutely no roof penetrations throughout the entire building. So the opportunity in Northern Ontario for leaks is minimized dramatically and I'll talk a little bit about our energy conservation methodology of the roof slope. It's a very, very simple structure uh, and I'll get into some of the construction and techniques that we're inclined to, again, keep the cost down, but to give you a state of the art building. So these, this is, these are the actual excerpts out of our specification under section 100. You can see how we plan to tackle. Uh, the project will be bid with the base bid, everything in. So that will be the number, first number that's presented. Um, and then there'll be an opportunity for three or four separate several separate prices because as we've gone along we've been asked to exclude a few other prices such as the ash hall uh, and a couple of other components but from uh, the tender aspect there'll be some major separate prices first being uh, separate price a separate price f separate price a is the base building and then b c and d are the three additional separate prices but you'll see we're on the next page uh, under alternate or separate price number three which is the option number B at the time, uh, we had carried this $250,000 allowance. So we're saying to the people tendering the price, 
remove council chambers, remove the washrooms, but include in your base bid an allowance of 250000 with which the owners, in the way we've written it, have total discretion of how to spend the money. At the end of the job, if, you, if it's not spent, you can credit it back. But it forces the general contractors at the time of bidding to include overhead and profit in the various allowances that we've carried. And there's several other allowances as well as contingencies that we've looked into. Uh, but the breakdown that we had uh, provided to the steering committee basically was 10,000 for some new entrance doors, uh, 5,000 for barrier free operators for that entrance, a new sound system and IT upgrade of 10,000, some signage support of five, $180,000 for an increase to upgrade the boardroom, um, and a uh, civil uh, 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 fee to redesign one field yet. And I'll explain all of that in a moment. And I also tucked in some miscellaneous contingencies that gave us the $250,000 mark, which again reconciles back to our option B. So if you go to, so uh, then as we were working through the project, in addition to the original order by the quantity surveyor, when we received soils information, as was alluded to, we're in a, a floodplain, the substrata underneath, we have a table of what's called a perch water table. We're not certain at this time if it's purely rainwater that's collected on the clay. We have an overburden of other types of material. Uh, some of it fill, some of it, some of the good fill, some of the bad fill, uh, or it potentially could be an aquifer. So consequently, uh, with the design of the field bed, and the Ministry of the Environment requirements, uh, if the field bed is designed for more than 10,000 liters per day of flow, you have to go to the Ministry of the Environment for approval, which takes about three years. So which, as a team and through our representatives, felt it was a bit too exhaustive. So we got creative to see how can we get around that opportunity. We split it into two, obtain approval from the Manual Conservation Authority to do so and come up with a system of two septic beds. To do so, because of the perch water table and what was going on, we have to add fill to the top, on top of the uh, play, the playgrounds and the soccer field. But the type of field bed that we've employed, you can actually use the surface on top. You don't have to stay off of it like this. So there's a cause to, to add it in. However, you can actually utilize that service. So away we went, and um, this is sort of the footprint of the two potential beds. But please remember, this is with base building A, the entire building. Um, and, and, and does not apply to option B. So if you select an option B, which is, and quite honestly, trying to maintain your budget, it's probably the most logical one that you have to go towards, removing the council chambers and removing the washrooms, we then don't have to build a septic, a second septic bed because of the volumes that those are reduced. But that was part of the investigation that we found. So we then met with the North Bay Matter Conservation Authority and discussed the use of their lands off of your property. They were very supportive. Uh, they felt as uh, 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 you know, Rushford had pointed out that it enhanced their properties. Interestingly enough, some of their uh, walkways and roads and, and culverts are actually on your property. And so it, currently you're using some of their property for a tennis court and parking. So there's a history there that it was a symbiotic relationship and they felt that they'd be complementary in terms of what would be placed on. So we looked at the opportunities because of your master plan and what we were actually doing, we have to push our parking and turn around space for the, uh, the fire uh, hall out towards the creek, build a retaining wall, and actually cut away some of the land across the creek for the cut and fill exercise to and maintain that area of floodplain. So if flood does come, we have a retaining wall to keep the water away and it floods in a very controlled manner. We talked about septic systems for the new development of which they were agreeing with these systems. We have to split it into two sites and that brings with it a whole other group of discussions. Talked about stormwater management, and this goes back to the point of building the floodplain. So they we asked very clearly for the direction what that actually meant. And they talked about two floodplains, one being a hundred year floodplain, um, and a, a, the second being a 500 year attendance floodplain, which um, the consensus was if that floods, so does Timmins and North Bay is in trouble. Uh, 
Uh, but so the the driving uh, uh, element was the level uh, of the floodplain presented, and they established that at, and well, forgive me if I don't remember the exact amount, but what does come to mind is if the 100-year uh, floodplain uh, is actually uh, about six inches below the floor level at that entrance door. Interestingly enough, the direction they provided to us their recommendation in time for the future is to be a meter or three feet above that floodplain for any proper future planning. And at the end of the day, in looking at costs and our design experience, we've increased that to about 10 inches or 250 millimeters above that one meter mark. So we're about 1.25 meters, about four feet roughly above the floodplain. And that performs several functions. One, Obviously, from floodplain, but from an aesthetic um, uh, direction, if you're driving on the street, the perception is you're you're not totally driving down into a lower basin area. That the building is raised up, and we get positive slope away from the building in all directions. So the 10 inches that we're adding to the building allows us to actually slope back. To the north side of the property because we know that you have current problems with water coming down parking lot into your existing building. So, so anyway, so with regards to the floodplain, uh, we then set our new elevation at that point and, and work everything out in terms of our topography from that. And then in turn, and in hand with stormwater management, uh, we have to, we are planning to have asphalted services for parking. You currently have in the range, and we'll take a look at the site plan. In the, in the range of 60 to 80, depending on how people park. You have no park surface, you have no controlling lines, and it's a little bit of a free for all, depending on who gets here first and where people park. So it's hard to act up an exact number. With the new planning and the additional use of, we have the potential for up to 137 to 140 spots. So substantially increasing parking to this particular site. Along with that is that how you deal with your stormwater management with park surface. In a rain event, it has to be collected and placed in a storage and slowly released back into the digital holding pond. We have to deal with any oils or salts, anything by ways of infiltrators within the, uh, the parking. So we had several discussions with, with North Bay Mountain Conservation Authority. They, the, the last being just last week, meeting with our civil engineers and working on the details on the size of the pond that has to be created and not accepted as well. Uh, so, and finally, with a phasing plan, that we had proposed our facing plan to them, which again was, I'm not certain if that's one of the things we reviewed, but it goes something like this, where we start by uh, introducing some holding tanks for these existing buildings, which then means we can decommission the existing septic system, let it lay fallow for a bit, build a new septic bed to handle the new buildings. Um, and then once that's in place, it gives you a baseline with which to start construction. We can then Provide a cut and fill exercise, increase the retaining wall of the creek, where cut and fill, take away the old septic bed. Then we have a tabula rasa, a clean slate with which the contractors can come to the site. So that's you know sort of the first phases, and several phases within it, and then they can start to build in earnest and then get through to the last phase being uh, decommissioning your existing building. So staff would have a place to work during construction and uh, as well. Then once a new building is built to move into it and it can be demolished and on phase completed. One point, Bernie, if we could just touch on cut and fill of the land, just so council understands what that, like just high level of that activity. Sure. So I have a slide that Perfect. that speaks to that in a moment. Um so but I will. Sorry, Jason. No, that's a good yeah. Okay. So uh, but thank you for for reminding you. So we've done several other things, try to um, create somewhat of a state of the art building. Um, we're utilizing uh, a SIP panel. So if anyone's familiar with the SIP metal panel, so basically it's a sandwich panel, um, very high efficiency in terms of our value. We get an R8 per inch with a four inch wall, roughly about 32. If you look at the building code, we're into about a 20 uh, requirement of 23, 24. So we're substantially higher than the walls with the roof. We've got a six inch panel, roughly about an R40. When, and so, uh, or 48. Uh, consequently, when we did our energy modeling with this type of system, 
Um, we're above and beyond your, uh, the base of the building code is substantial. We have a very efficient building. If you go to the next slide, Jason, you can see uh, the blue shows how we're improving upon the um, energy efficiency of the base building or the building code. Uh, by substantial amounts, we've also incorporated um, in slab heating within the building that gives you a very efficient system in terms of building operations. So there's a lot of uh, elements added into the building in terms of net zero passive house design, um, you know, uh, solar gain in terms of its orientation, uh, and also some intangibles in terms of views and design within the building. So uh, to go to the next slide. So to, to Jason's point, uh, we're going to be undertaking a cut and fill exercise, um, which will happen primarily in this particular area here. So, uh, and that we actually had one who's performed a fair amount of work and has quite a bit of in this area, has calculated and provided all of the civil engineering to do so. So that's part of the savings that you, the municipality, are able to provide. So um, we have structured the work in such a way that municipality can provide the work to do cut fill under the umbrella of the general contractor. So you do not have two contractors on site. The, the work that will be done will be verified by a third party, uh, soil engineering company, and then is included in the tender in such a fashion that the general contractor has to accept the work and take responsibility for and facilitate all of the work. So we minimize the risk to the municipality who get trying to reap the benefits of not giving that component of the work to the general contractor. So, and Antoine jump in if I'm not describing it exactly as you design it, but the intent is to, you can see the gradations here, each one of these, it's basically sloping uphill, is to make a cut back out into this area and introduce a new retaining wall, which allows us to fill the land in, in this fashion to allow the trunks to actually come out of the building. You can see this was the pond that was there before, and the new pond. And so but providing a retaining wall gives us a level surface with a slight, slight slope. This is the creek, and because we are not touching the water within the creek, we can perform the construction at any time. We do not have to stop the cold water period such as September. So phase one, along with providing holding tanks and leaving the existing septic system, which will happen to be a pool bay on top of or in fallow, you can build this wall, do a technical exercise requiring you to state the municipality can Guidance of that. Uh, so, this, and this is work that, that could start this fall. So, this is work that could be done this fall. So, uh, yes. Yeah. So, okay. further on, I have a little bit of a, of a proposal in terms of timelines and how it may actually work as well. Okay. But, um, so, with this particular uh, plan, it also though, takes into account uh, master planning, which might be there if we planned it look at a window of 75 to 100 years we always try and stay, um, promote looking forward to the future in terms of all the planning that we do at least a minimum 50-year horizon if you look at your existing building of 67 and we're 2012 and that's 23 that's 20, uh, 53 years just from the building that's there at the time there was two people originally in that building now there are 10 so we've increased by five if you're planning for 50 years and you're increasing by that multiple, whether right or wrong, you're looking at a space that you're going to require at least 50 people. So that's just an indicator in terms of whether it's right or wrong, but gives you a sense of really how we should be planning for the future, uh, whether it be proper storage or proper expansion. And it also sometimes has some un, un, uh, intended benefits that you'll see over time. Yeah, just to touch on that as well, because we had a conversation with uh, Paul and I were talking today as well. You go back to the initial municipal building before the addition was put on. You had two staff working upstairs. Later on, there was additional staff. There was two at the back. That was with the addition. But at the start, there was a council chambers. So where Paul's offices, Greg's and Monica's, was the council chambers. Okay. And on the opposite side, where the reception area is, was the two staff three that sat there. So you can just see what that building has become. It went from place for your staff and a council chambers and a fire chief's office because I've left them in volunteer to what and a boardroom to not having a boardroom no council chambers no free space like we've said before we're busting at the scene there is no room for growth 
but you can see that there's been additions put on. We've maximized the space. We've cut the boardroom and made it through offices. So there's a lot of history in the building that we're in now to say we've done as much as we could with what we have now. So there's, yeah. So we, on that vein, we always try and promote, and it's hard to, because of fiscal responsibilities and our experience, I'm, I have the luxury of working on buildings uh, that my former partners, which used to be Bridgeley, Delane, Trust, Revenue, and Bourbon, worked on in the 1950s, the 1960s. And they always planned ahead that 50 years. And when I come to work on some of them, they provided extra elevator shafts when our volumes go up, they're there. They provided extra building space in terms of voice. And it's a real joy to a future generation to be able to have that luxury of building these space. It's a hard call, I know, as counselors to spend the money and to rationalize it. But sometimes, well, it's just best practice and good plan. Go to the next slide. Uh, so you can see the um, this is the base building, uh, and but it's also planned to be a very flexible space and for future growth for staff, students, auditors. So it's not just from the the functional program of what we're dealing with of your current staff. It does flex at times uh, and is required. So if you go to the next slide, I think. Yeah, got some images. Now you can see in 3D sort of what the building uh, shape is starting to take on. Uh, this is a view from the Northeast. That's so, right. There was mention at one point that you were using a similar look and feel to Don Champagne's Champagne building as well. In some fashion, in some yes. Fashion. Yeah. So we're looking at, so if I might describe those panels a bit, it's a sip panel similar to that. The benefits are we're using a, con so Take a step back. We explored four different methodologies to build. We looked at totally a wood frame structure. We looked at heavy timber structure. We looked at uh, a conventional uh, building with a conventional exterior wall. And we looked at sit panel. And at the end of the day, of all of those costing that was done again by a third party, the most cost effective was this particular sit panel. Number one. Number two, uh, these sit panels did, are placed on not a pre-engineered building. We went with a conventional structural steel that we could obtain locally, support a local, local economy and environment, and local trades as well. Uh, but what we can accomplish with, we can build a superstructure and these SIP panels go up extremely fast, which allows you then to enclose your building and keep your cost down. From, so from a general contractor's perspective, you reduce the risk substantially by enclosing your building very quickly can go up almost at any time of the year. I actually had discussions yesterday with a general contractor that would be bidding the job, just sounding off again, different ideas in, and again, it just reinforces that particular base decision. So uh, very, and our building is intended to be, you'll see some graphics, uh, a very current, very modern uh, image to it as well. So view from the Northeast, view from the Northwest, you can see the panels that we've incorporated out in front of the existing uh, seniors hall uh, to get to tie in the facade from the new building to the uh, to the seniors hall. If you then uh, look, I've enlarged the floor plans to talk about some of the attributes and benefits. So this particular uh, highlights the three bays of the fire hall and the shared area. So we have. Uh, uh, in this instance, we have a bunker room where staff change. We have a clean and, and a tool room uh, for staff back up in here, uh, a bottle fill, and then shared areas being a staff lunchroom that can be accessed by both staff and the fire hall um, volunteers. Staff washroom, which include showers. We have a, a high density file storage room. We calculated repatriating all the files you currently have on site. Uh, that you pay for by bringing it back on site because it was a payback period. And uh, so the fire hall as well allows you to repatriate. You have several trucks, some are actually sitting on site uh, and are resting and are having to deal with the elements. This allows you to, again, operationally uh, keep them. But when you place them all within a fire hall, you actually have one bay that's, that's empty. So it's actually filling up all of those areas. And in this in the back are also equipment for fire, uh, uh, ice and water rescue, winter, off season. It allows you to drive homes without going to a vertical, a vertical shaft. And uh, anyway, so there's some attributes of it's not 
it, it's not um, excessive for what we saw in terms of what we asked for. Uh, we also uh, try to work in some additional benefits. We pump mechanical units on the inside of the space, on the west side, treated the mezzanine so they could actually put the ladders up and use it for training purposes off the mezzanine as well. So it's not a true mezzanine, but they can still use it in the fashion. So if you go to the next slide, Jason, please. Uh, this this area uh, of law may be council uh, chambers, uh, also with the boardroom to allow the uh, the council to recluse in terms of various meetings. Uh, we've got the mechanical room then on the main level and the universal washroom. Go to the next slide. And uh, you can then see the municipal office. Uh, this is sort of the main hall to allow the public to come in with a front of house or front door. To support staff play at the front door. We've got two meeting rooms accessible off the hall, which allows you security and control uh, from uh, the public. Uh, you've got various offices, deputy treasurer, deputy clerk, CBO planning, some future positions, public works. Uh, you've got the fire chief as part of this element. You've got shared and support back to here. And we've introduced some flex space. Uh, back into this area for future growth as well, which actually is a function for um, a collaborative work effort. We've located it on the south wall. You have views to the creek and the forest, and we've got one large open space to allow light to come in with a high ceiling uh, to allow light to come back in, at least to share the lower light to allow the office. So the hope is that it's very open and transparent in terms of the design. And uh, council chambers and public washrooms for future planning, we had incorporated the washrooms specifically off to the side with its own corner that connects to the public so that if it was uh, meeting after hours, municipal office, fire hall could be totally sealed off, allowing the public to use the washrooms. But also, these washrooms connecting to the exterior allows for. Uh, other events, whether it be rip fest or something going on, the public could come in and use uh, at that volume uh, with the washroom. And the building is also uh, designed OADA requirements, totally accessible to the building. Uh, it meets all the requirements. We have a specialist on staff that did a review. Uh, so, and so. Um, so, some sections you can see here. This is actually the floodplain in the blue. It gives you a sense of scale. So, that's the floodplain. In order to facilitate all this, we're adding in what's called lightweight fill, large billets of styrofoam, so that it performs several functions. It, it insulates the ground, stop frost from getting down. It also doesn't, um, because of the type of soils, uh, doesn't consolidate and, and minimize the shrinkage. We actually have four tests from the soils uh, engineer done to check the soils, the type of uh, where the water table was, the type of place under there, we went back and Test pits to understand the topography and the grade, and we went back and did, did a consolidation test to actually measure how much give that, that soil that the clay that you have to take. So, some interior views you can see uh, the blue arrow. So, from the front, immediately if you're looking through the window, you met with reception that have their own private areas. This is an enclosed photocopier, photocopier production area. On the sides are the various boardroom and meeting rooms. Some staff offices again with windows to get light and back into the shared space behind. You take a look at the shared space uh, in behind it. It's not excessive. Uh, it is planned for future growth, and as we talked about with the numbers, not unreasonable in terms of adding an additional potential four, maybe six spaces in there at best. Um, but it does provide the opportunity for collaborative growth. And an interesting offshoot, if it were built today, it would be highly used because of COVID in terms of spatial separation. So unintended benefits of that type of space sometimes you know, best practices dictate you get that extra flex, but um, so that's that's the, the space in terms of the future growth. And then looking at, um, looking back to various perils and, and, and the work spaces between uh, the front of house and back of house, which would be a key image of the interior. And again, some an aerial view from the south, looking from the south side of you, and here you can see the all that wind, south side of the building. To the next direction photograph, you can see an aerial from the 
the uh, view from the northeast looking down into the you can see the, the future courtyard and this green wall. And I, I had expressed the concern that there was not enough windows on the north side. Would you like explain that that was essential for? Uh, well, part of it is that we did we did include we have added at the request of the steering committee additional windows. Originally, we had very sparse windows, but it is the north side. And if we have an energy efficient building, we want to try and have windows on the south side to maximize solar gain, minimize the windows on the north side because your predominant winds come from the north, north, west, in this part of the world, in this site. And also, it is a, roughly a story and a half space with council chambers. That's a lot of volume to heat. So the more windows we have, the more potential. But we have introduced some windows, but we've also introduced windows with spandrel pan. So from the outside, you look, it looks like there's a, an area of windows, but it's actually a minimal amount of windows with other glazed surfaces that are insulated in front. So it gives the impression of a lot of windows aesthetically, but uh, the reality is there is a ribbon of windows that let some light into the council chambers as well. So again, we're trying to find that balance in terms of being economical, operationally efficient, and still um, you know, true to the values and the request that came from you of being you know, energy efficient building. <laughs> So as we near the end um, of this exercise with all the options that were on the table and one of the, the questions were on the table is how do we enhance that experience of council meetings and the board room? So we'd allocated $250,000 in that last option for some enhancement of, of a board, room, whether it meant utilizing this hall in some fashion or uh, dealing with, with the board. Room. So, we were asked to explore what are all the different options with the boardroom in this particular plan. So we went through and um, our first revision to the boardroom was to add additional space, roughly the width of the corridor, to increase the size of the boardroom. So that's kind of what it looked like. And we went back to the table and if you go to the next slide, we were asked to investigate even further. So we were asked if we could take a look at the opportunity for not only 15 additional people, potentially 30 people, potentially 40 people, uh, recognizing the original one was designed for 50. So at the end of the day, uh, the direction from the steering committee and consensus back to us was, could we explore one for uh, 40 people, 40 total, seven the council, including the staff, and 33 seats for the public, uh, what would that mean? And that was adding an additional 7.5 by about 12, uh, 12 meters of space. Uh, and along with it came a cost. So uh, if we go to the next slide. So we took a look at all the costs. So we had our quantity surveyors, we had the additional cost from the septic bed, and we had the increased boardroom, which we had some allocated funds. So the septic bed, um, the area increased boardroom, of 925 square feet, it's roughly a cost of 411,000. If we tried to enhance the border, we'd allocate 250,000, but if we went this method, it'd be 400. So we take the net difference based on our original cost estimate. And for the, the fuel bed, if we are going with the base plan, additional cost of 305,000. So, and that came about, you can see the numbers from the civil engineer, uh, 421. But we have to remember to go to the next slide, Jason that in the original quantity surveyor's report, we had allocated 170,000 for a cloud bank. So that gives us a net difference of 305,000. And um, so then if we kind of, in, you know, kind of take a look at the impacts of everything, um, if the septic bed, uh, if you upgraded it, went with the entire project, you're looking at uh, an additional expense based on our original uh, estimates of about 300,000. But if you select option D, the second one's not required. So that becomes cost neutral. So basically what you're saying is that I can't really see the cost up there, but you're saying that that would not come into play if you're in <laughs> option D, we would not have to build a second step. At the cost of 305 Okay, so that would okay. be excluded from that. Um, and as well, um, if you increase the boardroom, the cost of 411,000, uh, we had allocated 250,000 for originally for an upgrade, but that was something, whether it be, we didn't know at the time what it was, but the net difference between, if you went to the scheme that had 7.40 people, 7.5 meters, that'd be 411,000, the net difference being 160,000 that we could estimate at this time. 
So, I mean, that's totally discretionary as part of the option. Again, if you went for everything, the potential increase would be about 700,000. But again, it's, it's totally discretionary. And that's still with three firewalls, double firewalls. That, that's like the firewall, I guess, not to Graham when we had gone to um, Kowasi. That is what we're reflecting here. Yeah. Fixed, uh, yeah. 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 So that is fixed. So it's six. I call them double bays. Yeah, three double bays. Three double bays. Thank yeah, you. Correct. We're going right now from two single bays to three double bays. Three double. So we're going from space for two to six. Yeah, basically. Okay. So um, go to the next slide. So I uh, talked a little bit about timing, schedule, and COVID impact. COVID impact. So with, with everything, we try to provide you with as much information. And it's been vetted at times pretty rigorously through screening. Um, and so there's been lots of healthy discussion and uh, lots of uh, good, frank discussion, of which lots of information has been exchanged. So I'm feeling quite good from my perspective and all the consulting team, and I think the steering committee is as well, that we've pretty well done it. No stone unturned for this scale, scale inside the project. But with that, we're bringing to the table multiple options for you as council to decide all of the parameters that uh, Mayor Rushford had laid up. You can proceed, you proceed, uh, or you proceed in the side. So that sits on the table. Um, now, we're anticipating definitely a fall start, uh, but there have been some impacts because of COVID. I mean, it's just the reality of my world at the moment, in our world. But we're still, we're, we just received last Thursday, Friday, the final sales report after three iterations of challenging, challenging it again. We have to wait for the civil work to finalize the work after the last meeting last week with the United States Matter of Conservation Authority. Uh, structural, mechanical electrical is about 95% complete. Structural is about 95% complete. Architectural is about 85% complete, waiting on civil and the soils report and civil is about 80 percent but that will close very quickly in terms of finalizing all of our work once we have all work complete we're going to then vet it one last time through the steering committee and then great ken macro has been an invaluable resource as well with a different set of eyes and looking at it uh, from uh, your representatives third party perspective which is very helpful and then we get to tender. We're anticipating three weeks to tender, um, possibly a bit of an extension, but we that last week is usually spent with the client for negotiations with the general contractor. We're planning a two-day closing period where the base bid closes on, on a Wednesday at two o'clock. We're going to leave 24 hours unopening the tenders by the general contractors to have the separate pricing close to allow people with with uh, uh, cooler heads prevail to actually look at their costing so they're not just throwing numbers at it at the same time as the base bid closes, which reduces the contractor's risk and theoretically improves your opportunity for better pricing. Once that happens, then the, the numbers come to council for them to make the decision, but there's also the opportunity for us to negotiate with the successful low bidder. They've all been pre-qualified, we all assume they're all capable of doing the work and qualified. But we had a chance to go back and say, you have any opportunities? Do you see anything with what's happening in the marketplace? You know, to bring the cost down. So there's that component that allows us to negotiate. The client then is to select from the three options, or budget, on budget, on budget, uh, for a false start. Now, with other work that I've done in the past for major projects, and uh, specifically with hospital work, and I really confirmed this yesterday, um, with hospital work, um, say I'm working in an ER that runs 24 7, and a contractor is asked to come in. Often there's multiple stages, and I've done it where we've had as many as eight to 10 different stages. But what happens once you start work in a confined space in a very sensitive area, you can't stop because there's delay claims, there's risk to the people, risk of staff. So we've developed a little bit of a system that's worked fairly successfully. And used it on the last five or six hospital jobs 
where we start the project, we put out the documents, have our shop drawings underway, materials are ordered. Even in the perfect situation, door frame for the mechanical systems take six to eight weeks as a minimum after shop drawings are approved. So what we've done is we started the job, we got shop drawings organized with our inspection control and hospital setting all organized. In this instance, it will be like a natural conservation where we make applications in advance. But then the project in earnest doesn't start until all of the materials are either on site or are available in the critical path. And what that affords you, the client, to do is to start, do your groundwork in the fall, which I've also done in another project. You stop for the months of December, January, February, weather dependent. But you tell all the contractors at the beginning, this is the plan. So that they're not including in your project winter heat. They don't have to tarp it in, they don't have to provide winter heat, which is a savings to you, but also the quality of the work. Working in winter at minus 30, they get about 25% efficiency, if that, and also quality of the work is substantially down. If the shovel is not frozen. Recommending to you, Council, to consider that it shuts down if it's a really severe winter, December, January, February, to allow all of the materials to arrive or to be kept in factories or to be able to be dealt for critical paths. When they start up in the springtime, then they can hit gangbusters and, and go. So there, there should be, and I've seen it before, theoretically, some time made up, especially with the systems that we've employed, the set panels, we can, structural steel can start a little bit earlier. They can be into a February where easily it's not but that weather dependent and quality control can be maintained. But the SIP panels then can go up very quickly and then you've got an enclosed space to work in the springtime. So, um, so potentially phases one to five could be undertaken. That's the cut fill exercise, that's the septic system, that's preparing the site, including pouring the foundations and introducing the lightweight fill underneath potentially stopping at that point. Having steel manufactured, having your SIP panels, having your mechanical systems underway, and potentially um, uh, February. Now, if the weather's great, they can work a little bit longer, and if it's early spring, they can tighten it up. Typically, we do get that blast of two weeks of minus 30 that, that can factor. So if all the contractors are aware of this up front, then they're all bidding on apples to apples, and it should be reflected in the cost, tenders, tender costs that you receive but it also doesn't give anyone an unfair advantage. But if they can make time up because of good weather, uh, there, there's no increase to your bonding in doing so. I checked with that yesterday as well. So there's no additional cost from a bonding perspective, whether it's an extra month or two. And it has been my experience over 30 some, close to 40 years, that there's, so I've only had one project ever be completed on time. We have lots of them on time on budget, but uh, not many of them are exactly on time. So they always expand. And 10%, you know, 10, the last 10% of the, the last 3% of the work usually employs 10% of the effort to try and get it cleaned up and get the end. So, anyway, that's a proposal to the council to consider. That's what I'm recommending in terms of trying to deal with COVID at this point in time. Sorry. Brian also said the other day that there could be advantages as well for pricing because currently, it, 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 people in the marketplace talk about how the prices have escalated or there's some products that are difficult to get. So it gives us a long period for the contractor to purchase then the source product. The source product. Like we just yesterday, or the weekend, uh, plywood, uh, plywood at twenty dollars sheets now at forty five, forty eight dollars. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and trying to get it is another thing. You're trying to yeah. trying to find it. So it it's a whole new world out there. We as contractors are also reactive, but we have ten solid contracting firms pre qualified. If we give them some flexibility. I'm hoping, no guarantees, but I'm hoping it has some reflection in if, if you can reduce their risk and remain flexible, it should have an impact on, on what you're doing in terms of the pricing. I'm hoping. But no, this is totally new. Now, I did hear as well on CDC yesterday that the government, in terms of the future, what they're planning are both infrastructure and um, trying to infuse capital into, as they did to do infrastructure. So potentially there may be something coming down the pipe as well. I don't know if you've had any discussions. I have personally contacted the RMP, just put it out there that we're working on this project. So he's totally aware of it as well. So um, so if you go to the next slide, Jason. So that's sort of a rendering that we just completed yesterday to give you a little bit of color of what uh, what 
the facility uh, uh, going to look like. Again, we're looking to keep keeping elements very clean, very modern, um, and highlighting uh, sort of the entrance from a, a wayfinding point of view, where the entrance is with your logo. And uh, as a hopefully as a final touch, uh, the project will be everything goes right. The stars line up. The COVID helps and that it'll be ready for your 100th uh, anniversary in 2021 in terms of it completing construction to be able to open the doors. Well, that, that is interesting because the actual date when there was a, it's in December of 2021. So it does give us a full uh, 12 months in that sense, so it's construction time. So at any rate, uh, questions? I know I said, please, you know, any questions, it's been actually pretty quiet. So either something's wrong or it's not. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> Are there any questions? Do you have anything that I either missed? Do you like further information? Okay, so that's encounter. We won't go in any order, just that talk Yeah. What's the length of the fire bay? The double base? Yes. The one with the length. What is the length? The length of your fire base. The length of the fire base. <laughs> yes. I tried to look at that. Uh, yeah, no problem. I couldn't figure it out. With me, yeah, and so which slide is on? Well, I can, I'm on. I'm on it right now. But. Yeah. Okay. So the width of each bay is 5.704 meters. Uh, so that's you know, 5.2 meters. One of them is slightly larger to get to make up for the wall and the length. Overall length is eleven point so one bay is four point two six seven by eleven point four five two. So it's twenty two point eight meters uh, overall. The length? The length is sort. Twenty two point eight. Twenty-two point one eight. Twenty-two point one eight meters. Yeah, and that was derived by obtaining the actual specifications of your fire truck and or what is planned for the future, and allowing six feet of space in front of each fire truck between the fire truck and the door, not to allow people to go around it and vet it by your fire chief. So it's not excessive, but it allows for a movement in front of each of the vehicles when there's two of them parked. Second question. Uh, just looking at your photo here, that one specifically. The bay doors are the bay doors going to be glass or are they going to be solid? No, they're tend to be. Uh, we were very impressed with Blossom's doors. We asked how they function, how they were in terms of energy efficiency. Uh, they also have an inside heating system as planned here, and they said they work fabulously because. They allow light, but they're a polycarbonate dual layer system. So it allows light in, but it's not to, it's not totally okay. So it's an insulated door trapping air with a polycarbonate. So it's not an insulated metal door, so it's not solid, but it's not totally okay. So if you want to have a look at how they function or what they work, you could go to Boston. So in the research we did, yeah, we I know went they, there. Yeah. I know exactly what they are. Yeah, I'm just kind of wondering the cost difference between the closed doors and uh, solid doors. Um, that's definitely something. That's just a question. Yeah, I, um, we had to be I, answered I, at a later time. Yeah, I tweeted. I can. I'd be glad to find it. Okay. I'm fine, thank you. Hey, no, it's excellent. Good design. Something's wrong. 
presentation, I mean, you, uh, I can't uh, say how thankful we are to actually our building inspector when we initiated the initial work that Brian uh, brought in. You've, you've uh, really uh, stepped up to the plate and been extremely helpful. And Craig, uh, as well as our consultant, we've been very fortunate to land in your hands, in other words. And so thank you very much. Well, it's reciprocal, so we've got a great team, actually. Mm -hmm. Anything like this is never done in isolation. So it's always been with a strong team and, and, uh, and, and lots of vetting. So it's, it's, it's been good. Yeah, yeah, we've certainly, if I had to add something, we've certainly not rushed the process. No. And like Brian said, we've vetted. I mean, we've probably not left any stone unturned, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, with the amount of people we were as part of the steering committee, we've got that many more heads to ask the questions mm -hmm. and to think outside of the box, I guess, and what else can be done. So I don't think there's something we haven't looked at. And in mind, we knew right from the get go when that first estimate came in at over 10 million, said, we got some work to do here. We had done quite a bit of work at that point. Mm -hmm. and so from April to now has been a lot of work. Lot of work. But I believe we began this process in the fall of last year when you first hired Brian. Yeah. So it's been quite a bit of work. It's not something we've rushed to say we're ready to go for tender, but there's been a substantial amount of work. Really. From the note, uh, we are going to proceed then with the resolution that allows us to proceed, uh, giving direction to proceed with tender. And uh, then, would you say that the top, I said five weeks, well, that's the additional week that you need to finish yeah, your no, work? I, I did want to contradict you there. Okay, <laughs> that's okay. From what I know right now, um, civil, a couple of weeks done, just to get civil work done. Okay. And then once civil work is done, uh, and uh, we go through the solid work for, I need about a week with which to coordinate, just take a look at all the disciplines with one final set. So okay. we're about, Three weeks of I'm shooting for the end of August to tender the booth, but that's kind of my time for and then we'll be able to tender, which is about three weeks. So maybe six weeks, maybe seven weeks, and that way like five weeks yeah. is a bit tight, but if we can it's it's our job to say five weeks, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, and 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 COVID has added a few interesting yeah. wrinkles into my consulting world at this point in time as well. So but uh, that's what we're anticipating. Realistically. Don, I know we'll turn it over to an answer. I mean, we'll do it in a second here. We'll break up for four meetings. I think it's five o'clock for Kelly. Sure. Kelly? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Five o'clock is there. All right. The Sorry. Council of the Municipality of East Paris accepts the presentation from Mr. Brian Duncan of Duncan Wheeler Architects Inc. for the new municipal office hall pro fire hall project and approved that Duncan Wheeler Architects. So I know we thank you very much for coming today and we look forward to uh, our further discussion in uh, six weeks. <laughs> <laughs> this is, um, thank you. I might so just one, one last comment. <laughs> yeah. what, one last comment. Inevitably, you know, 11 o'clock tonight. That's when you're going to think of all those questions that you have asked. So don't hesitate through Jason, if you would. If there's anything else, by all means, we'll glad be glad to follow up. So inevitably, it always happens. But please, but if you could, rather than individually send, you could consolidate it all through Jason. It'll get done more efficiently, and then through Greg and back to myself, and we'll be able to get to an answer. So thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Brian. Okay. Thanks, guys. So let's take a two minute break and we will be proceeding in a moment with our in camera session. And please don't forget to put on your mask.
I require a voter and a seconder, moved by Councillor Batman and seconded by Councillor Kelly. That this meeting proceeds to in camera session at 4 32 p.m. under section 239 bracket 2 bracket H of the Municipal Act 2001. SO 2001 chapter 25 in order to address a matter pertaining to information explicitly supplied in confidence to the municipality or local board of Canada, a province or territory or a crown agency of any of them. Mm -hmm. uh, all in favor? 